This morning, we're going to be going through the parables of Jesus as we've been going through throughout the season of Lent in 2024. And today's parable is very interesting only because I call it the ironic parable. And this parable, some of you may know it, some of you may not. It's the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. And we find that in Luke chapter 16. But before we open up our Bibles this morning and actually look into the text, I wanted to give you some context. Now, context is really important because it gives more uh, meat into the story that we're about to read. And the context of this passage is this book you see in front of you, it's the Jewish Old Testament called the Tanakh. Now the Tanakh is the Hebrew Bible, and again, remember Jewish people do not believe that Jesus is the the Son of God, and they're still waiting for a Messiah. And so their Bible actually ends in the Old Testament. And their Bible is comprised of three different sections. The first section is Torah, which is the section of the law that starts from Genesis, and it goes all the way to Deuteronomy. The first five books of the Bible are called the Torah, and that is in the Tanakh. The second part of Tanakh is called the Nevi'im Prophets. Now, what this is, is there are eight books of the major prophets, like Isaiah and Ezekiel, and it includes all of the major prophets. And then finally, the Tanakh is comprised of a third section called the Ketuvim. And the Ketuvim are 11 books of writings from uh, various prophets and sages. Now, why do I talk about this? Because according to the Tanakh, uh, which is, again, the Jewish Bible, There's a belief that God has blessed certain characters like Abraham and Moses and King David and especially King Solomon. If you remember reading in the Old Testament, these men were very rich. Abraham had a lot of livestock. Moses led the entire Israelites out of Egypt. King David, as the king, had multiple, multiple palaces and and places and even wives. And King Solomon was the richest of all of these men. And in this, so for the Jewish people, when they were reading the Old Testament, they made this assumption that if you were rich, that God would bless you, that you were automatically blessed by God if you were rich. And so at this time of Jesus, at the time of Jesus, a lot of the Pharisees and the rabbis actually uh, compared God's favor with each other by how rich a person was. And so a lot of these priests and rabbis in the old days, in Jesus' time, they were comparing themselves with each other and saying things like, well, you know what? You may have a Tesla, but I have a Bentley, and so I am more favored by God. And they would even say, well, you have a Bentley? Well, I have 10 Rolls Royces. And then that person would say, well, I'm more blessed than God than you are. And then finally, somebody like, um, uh, what is it, Bill, not Bill Gates or whoever, might come up and say, well, I have a super yacht that I'm building right now. And so I am the most blessed by God. And so you could see what was happening with these rabbis and these priests in Jesus' time. They actually thought that the more rich they were, the more blessed of God that they would be. Now, this is terrible theology, but this was the predominant thinking back in Jesus' time. And it comes as a result of the words that were written in the Tanakh. And so with this concept, and if you can kind of put yourselves in that situation in 0 AD, when Jesus, around 33 AD, where Jesus was giving this story, 
I believe this will give you a better idea of how ironic and how shocking Jesus' parable truly was. So we open up our Bibles to Luke, chapter 16, and in the midst of all of these people, these these high-ranking priests and uh, uh, Jewish leaders comparing themselves with one another, Jesus says this, There was a rich man, who, uh, there was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and lived in luxury every day. Now, there are a couple of, oh, I love this. Okay, we have a, a pointer. All right, so now, <laughs> maybe I should use this more often. So it says that there was a rich man who was dressed in purple. Now, this is important. There are three things that come out from this first verse that Jesus talks about. Number one, that this man was dressed in purple. This is not just any purple, ladies and gentlemen. This is actually purple that was, uh, comes from this mollusk. I don't know if you can see really well, but this purple is a beautiful purple. It's actually called Tyrian purple. And this was one of the most costliest and most mysterious of the dyes of all of ancient times. I mean, just to get a little squirt of this from this mollusk was so expensive that it was first used by the Phoenicians. They found out that they can use purple dye for this. Uh, and it was taken from the secretion of two types of mollusks. Number one, it was the Murex brandaris. That was the first mollusk. And number two, the purpura, purpura, which is where we get purple from, purpura hemostoma. And these two mollusks were reserved only for the use of royalty, priests, and nobles. This was so expensive and so hard to get that only the rich of the rich used this type of purple. Not only that, but second thing we see is, so this man was rich, we know that. And we also know this fine linen. Now this fine linen is actually important because uh, one of the scholars, biblical scholars named Barclay, he actually talks about this really amazing fine linen that was only reserved for the elite. He actually, Barclay actually says that it cost one gold coin per square yard for linen. This is like the undergarment. So, I mean, this is really expensive underwear. We're not talking like Hanes or Fruit of the Loom. We're talking one square yard would cost one gold coin. Does anybody know how much right now an ounce of gold costs? One gold coin? Yeah, perfect. Uh, almost. Uh, we're playing prices right again. Uh, he's right, 2,500. Right now it's about, last time I looked, I think it's 2,150. 2,000. $150 for a pair of underwear. Can you imagine paying that amount? That is some rich, rich linen. And then finally, it says he lived in luxury every day. Now, the Greek word for luxury is actually the word for parties. You know the parties you have that you throw that are really big deal and it costs a lot of money? You do once a year, that's your birthday party, right, usually. Well, this is what this man did every single day, every day. Not once a year, not once a month, but this guy was so rich that he had these lavish parties every single day. Now, Jesus is providing the context. And he's actually speaking this parable to all the Pharisees. And so these Pharisees might have thought, wow, he can dress in purple. That's really expensive. He's got these fine linens that cost $2,000 per piece. And then now he can have a party every single day. My goodness, this man must be blessed. And then so Jesus continues on in verse 20. In the next verse, Jesus says, at his gate, this rich man's gate, 
was laid a beggar named Lazarus, covered with sores and longing to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs, even the dogs came and licked his sores. First thing we notice here in these first verses is at his gate he was laid. Meaning, this beggar Lazarus, he couldn't get up on his own. He couldn't stand up and walk to the gate on his own. He had to be placed there, probably by family or friends, to beg for money. This is how poor he was. And not only that, but he was covered with sores, which means he didn't even have enough money to get care, to get the medicine that he needs for his sores. I mean, this man was so poor, and he longed to eat what fell from the rich man's table. Now, this is interesting. We know that Lazarus was not at the end of this rich man's table waiting for like the scraps and the crumbs to come down. What does this mean? Because we know that he was laid at the gate. He was outside the house, not inside the rich man's house. And so what was he doing? He was looking for garbage. He was rummaging through garbage. The stuff that these rich people throw out, the stuff that nobody wants, Maybe the food that got old and nasty and crummy. This is the food that Lazarus was digging through. And not only that, but finally, even the dogs came and licked his sores. Now, you have to understand something. We live in a time now, in an age, where dogs are man's best friend. But back in the biblical times, I will tell you, especially with Jewish people, uh, they did not look at this time at dogs as best as man's best friend. They didn't. They actually, uh, they were like mutts, right? They would kick them out of the house, get out of here, shoo, shoo. And they were treated badly, these dogs. Dogs were hated back then. They were more of a nuisance. Yet it's interesting in this verse, it says that even the dogs came and licked his sores. Meaning that for Lazarus, who had sores all over his body, who was digging through trash to get some food, who was begging in front of the gate, the only, I don't even want to say person, the only animal that would take care of this guy Lazarus, the only animal that treated Lazarus good was these dogs. The most rejected of the people at the time. They were the ones who actually, you know, when a dog gets hurt, they lick its sores. And so the only person or the only animal, that, that creature that really cared for Lazarus, were these dogs who were licking Lazarus's sores just to make him feel a little bit better. The rich man didn't care for him. None of his family and friends cared to stick around, but it was the dogs that would care for this man named Lazarus. And finally, I do want to say before we move on, it's very important to notice that in every, uh, some scholars don't believe that this is a parable. They have a hard time believing this is a parable because of his name, Lazarus. Usually when Jesus gave a parable, he always used to say things in general terms. Like one day a man walked from Jerusalem to Jericho. One day a rich man. Or he would talk about dough. And he would talk about uh, mustard seeds. He wouldn't use specific names. And next week when Pastor Unsu is going to be preaching, notice that in the parable of the prodigal son, no names are mentioned. But yet Lazarus, his name is mentioned. And so a lot of scholars have a little hard time in, one, in thinking, well, this is weird because Jesus, in all the parables he used, this is the first time he used the name. And his name was Lazarus. And Lazarus actually is a Hebrew derivative of the word Eleazar, which actually means 
God is my helper. So it's interesting that for the first time in all of Jesus' parables, he actually names this poor person and says, this man's name is God is my helper. But when you look at his life with dogs licking the sores, I'm telling you, this guy does not look like a man whose God is helping him. Most of the Pharisees would have looked at this story and said, oh, poor Lazarus, this guy, God is my helper? God's not helping this guy. He's so poor. He's so destitute. There's nothing going for him. Well, we're going to see the importance of his name in just a little bit. Next verse. We read, uh, sorry, next verse. We read in Luke chapter 16, verse 22. The time came when the beggar died and the angels carried him to Abraham's, uh, to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and was buried. Now this is interesting because now the, 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 the story shifts. But it says here, first of all, the time came when the beggar died and we don't see any burial. Um, it says right away that the angels came and carried him to Abraham's side. Now, we all know this. Um, rich people can afford funerals. I don't know if anybody knows how much it costs to, to run a funeral, but it's a lot of money. I just was talking to someone yesterday, and I was reminded of the funeral costs and how much it costs to just even do a funeral. So I was thinking in my head, oh, man, I, I'm going to tell my kids just a... Uh, uh, cremate me. Because <laughs> I mean, seriously, like it's so expensive to buy a plot, to buy the casket, to have the service, to have all of these things. The only person in this story that was actually buried was this rich man. He was buried and had a proper burial, but Lazarus, he had nothing. Probably no one even cared that he died. And so, um, the rich man had this burial because, again, only rich people can afford burials. Now, here's where things get really interesting. The next verse, in verse 23, it says, In Hades, which means hell. In hell, where this rich man was in torment, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus, by his side. That was so shocking to these uh, listeners. So he called to him, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue because I am in agony in this fire. It is important to note that when Jesus said this, that the rich man was in Hades, I'm telling you, the whole group of Pharisees must have gasped and said, <gasps> what? The rich man? The rich man is supposed to be by Abraham's side. The rich man is the one who's blessed by God. He should be the one in heaven, not this Lazarus character who doesn't give you know two cents about this guy and so this would have confused and angered a lot of the pharisees to whom jesus was speaking to because once again their thought was the richer you are the more god has blessed you but now Jesus is turning the tables and the irony of this parable is that it's Lazarus who's actually now by the side of Abraham. And the second thing I want you all to notice is that look at the way this rich man talks in hell. He calls out to Father Abraham and he says, Father Abraham, have pity on me and send Lazarus to dip his finger and give me just one bit of uh, uh, thirst-quenching water on my tongue. Do you see how this rich man thinks of Lazarus? He thinks of him as his personal servant. Here he is in hell. 
And he is looking up to heaven, seeing that Abraham is there, and this Lazarus character that he spit on, that he didn't really care about, that he thought was lower than scum of the earth. He looks at him and he's like, what? Well, now tell that guy, tell Lazarus to come and serve me. Do you see this guy's attitude, this rich man? Even in hell, he doesn't repent. He doesn't change his ways. He still sees Lazarus as his lackey, as his personal servant, as nothing but a two-bit, you know, not even a human. Tell him to come down and put some water to, so that I can get out of this fire. And so Abraham replied, son, remember that in your lifetime you received the good things while Lazarus received the bad things. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony. And besides all this, between us and you is a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot and vice versa, nor can anyone from cross over from there to us. What is Jesus saying through this parable? He is speaking about I think someone's really uh, trying to contact somebody. Better get that. <laughs> um, what is Jesus trying to say? He's talking about the finality of death. When judgment time comes, when our life is over, there is no redo. There is no like afterlife. And once we are placed where you know God puts us, judges us, it's it. There's no way you can cross over to one side or the other. And this beggar, this beggar under, oh, I'm sorry. I, okay, I'm so sorry. I did not uh, put this. Uh, so let me read this once again. But Abraham replies, son, remember that in your lifetime you received the good things, while Lazarus received the bad things. But, uh, yeah, following along. But now he is comforted here and you are in agony and besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been set in place so that those who want to go from here to you cannot, nor can anyone cross from there to us. Jesus is talking about the finality of judgment. And so this, the way we live our lives here on this earth is important. It's not a waste. And it's not some fleeting thing. It's actually, there is a finality of heaven and hell. And he's talking about that we cannot cross between this great chasm. And so this man, the rich man, understands this and actually says, he answered in verse 27, he answered and says, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have five brothers. Let him warn them so that they will also come, they will not also come to this place of torment. The reason why I call this sermon the ironic parable, because now we see that it is the rich man now who's begging. This parable started off with Lazarus, who was the beggar. But now in heaven, it's the rich man now who's begging God. And he says, I beg you, Father, send Lazarus to my family, for I have these five brothers, and they don't really, they, they, they live like me. They didn't really care about the Bible. They didn't really, you know, care much about, they really cared about the things of this world. Please let them know that there's an afterlife that there is a judgment. And please, once again, look at what it says. Send Lazarus. Once again, he looks at him as his own personal servant and his lackey, and he says, you know what? Send Lazarus to go speak to my family. He doesn't see Lazarus as a human being. He looks at him constantly as this servant of his. And so what does Abraham reply in the next verse, 29? Abraham replied, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them listen to them. But this rich man's reply is, no, Father Abraham, he said, please. But if someone from the dead, from the actual dead goes to them, 
They will repent. I'm telling you, they'll change their ways. And to that, Moses says, he said to them, if they do not listen to Moses and the, and the prophets, they will not be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. And this is the end of Jesus' parable. What is the lesson that he is trying to teach these Pharisees to whom they are talking to? You notice that for this rich man, even though burning in hell and in the agony of thirst, I mean, he really wanted just one drop of water to quench his thirst. Notice that in all this dialogue, in all this time, there is not one iota of sorrow. There is not one iota of, oh man, I, you know what? I really did wrong. I repent. I'm so sorry. No, instead what we see this rich man is it's a hardening of the heart. You ever try to talk to somebody whose heart is hardened? Like you try to give them another avenue or way of thinking and you're like, you know what, you may be wrong. And then there are some people who are just, no, I am right. I am just, I'm going to keep going my way. And they just get harder and harder. Like the best example I always hear about is when couples are driving and one person, doesn't matter if it's the husband or wife, usually these, these um, uh, uh, illustrations are always the husband who has a hard heart, right? I, I think that's very unfair. I think women have a hard heart just as much as men. Amen? Men? Come on, yeah. You don't want to sleep on the couch tonight, so everyone is just zipping their mouths, right? But you ever drive with someone and you suggest that this is the wrong place? Maybe you should look at the map and maybe you should go the right place. And then the other person's like, no, I know this street's back in the, from the back of my head and I know like the back of my hand, trust me. And the further and further you go the wrong way, guess what's happening? The further and further you get, you know, you get sidetracked from your actual destination. This is what it's like to harden your heart, especially against God. When you harden your heart so much against God, no matter what proof is given to you right in your face, even if someone resurrects from the dead, rises from the dead, if your heart is, if your heart is hardened, there's no turning back. There's no turning back. And I actually have proof of this. You know where the proof comes? Take a look at Matthew chapter 28. I, I found this is to be so amazing to me. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 28. All right. While the women were on their way, this is the day of the resurrection. Jesus rises from the dead. This is Easter Sunday. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened, meaning Jesus rose again from the dead. When the chief priest had met with the elders and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money. This is so important. They gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, telling them that you are to say his disciples came during the night and stole Jesus' body away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. Holy cow, these Pharisees and these rabbis, these elders of the law, these elders and priests, they saw the resurrection. They witnessed Jesus coming back from the dead. They knew without a shadow of a doubt that this happened. Yet because of their hardening of their hearts, because they were so stubborn and they, they, they felt that Jesus was not the Messiah, that he's a liar, He's a Shonden fraud. He's just, he's a fraud to all these people. All these, these, these leaders paid the soldiers to lie about Jesus' resurrection. And so the soldiers took the money and did as they were instructed. 
how hard is your heart have to be that when you see something proof positive, that there is actual proof in front of you that you won't even see it because you have to be right. And this is the beauty of Lazarus. This is the beauty of his name. His name means the Lord, I trust in the Lord. Yeah, his life might not have been great. And he might have been a beggar searching for crumbs from a garbage can. But his heart wasn't hardened because his heart was trusting in the Lord even in those difficult times. What is our posture this morning? Where is our heart? Is our heart so hardened that even though that we see the, the, the grace and the love of Jesus Christ and the proof of the resurrection, that we're still like, no, no, that can't be. It's, it's just a bunch of lies. It's just the Bible. It, it's not really that important. Or do we live a life where we actually are confronted by God sometimes and we actually have the heart, the, the malleable heart to say, God, you are right, and I am wrong. I put my trust in you. That's a man or a woman who is blessed by God. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Today, for our prayer reflection, um, I actually wanted to do something just a little bit different. And I wanted to share with you all a song that, is, that really shows the, the value of putting our trust in God. Um, I know this is our prayer of, I know this is our prayer of reflection, but if we can all uh, open our eyes at this moment and take a look. This song called Be Thou My Vision is one of my favorite hymns. And if you want to sing it along with the words, you're more than welcome to. If you want to really um, keep this in your heart and ask God to search your heart, I invite you to do that this morning. But I want you to take a look at the third verse, Riches I heed not, nor man's empty praise. I thought that was such a great way to summarize today's Bible verse that we sang. So let me play for you all.
Father, I pray that you would be our greatest inheritance. Father, that we would not look at our riches that so easily disappear. Father, I pray that we're not chasing after man's praise that is so momentary. Father, I pray that just like this song says, that it will be thou and thou only that is first in our hearts. This morning, help us to be like Lazarus, who trusted in you and you alone. No matter their circumstances, Father, I pray that if there's anyone here this morning that feels like a Lazarus this morning, that they feel that blessed, I, I pray that they would hear these words, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Lord, I pray, Lord Jesus, that you would help heal the Lazarus is among us as we trust in your unfailing love. Father, and this morning, if we, find, if we find some connection with the rich man this morning, where we really don't care about others and we look at others as a means to our own end and we're always focused on the riches of this world, Father, may this morning's parable be a striking, uh, may it strike our hearts that we wouldn't get harder, that our hearts would not get harder, but that it would get softer. Because Jesus was trying to call the Pharisees to repentance and humility. Father, would you bless all of your congregation members this, this day, and may your Holy Spirit lead us to soften our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.